Good day, David. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. You're in England, in London, I believe, and I'm in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina. So we've got a big distance here. Let's hope our uh, transmission quality is sufficient uh, for our needs today. Very welcome, uh, Guy. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and, first of all, tell us where you grew up, where you went to college, and what you studied? Yeah, sure. So um, I've always lived in the, uh, the south of England. I am, uh, I'm, I'm currently near Brighton uh, and was born and brought up in, uh, in the counties around the outside of London. Uh, my uh, stepfather was in the, the police and tended to move around a lot. So we saw plenty of the home counties, um, went to plenty of schools, made lots of friends um and eventually settled um quite near, near the coast in uh in south a place called south end in the uh the the southeast of uh of england well good um yes so so what tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and then we're going to go fill in the gap from uh school which but i didn't let you get to quite yet so go ahead and, and backfill on that if you'd like yeah cool well so at the moment uh i am with loop and uh what we do at Loop is try to, to solve the e-learning problem, which is, and I'll talk about my background in a, in a bit, the e-learning problem as I see it is if you provide people with something that they don't want, they don't use it. And if they don't use it, it has no effect. So, uh, so we look to solve that problem by giving people what it is they need when they need it in a format that they recognize and they find useful. Um, and that beats the engagement problem and gets you well down the line uh, towards performance. So that's what I do. And my role in that is I'm the mouthpiece, really, as well as, uh, uh, as having a, a say in the direction in which we, we build the platform and we, we grow the company. But, uh, but primarily, I am the voice. I am the face for my sins uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of the company. Well, so what did you study in college? Where did you go to college? So I went to Kingston, um, which is just outside of London, and I studied uh, HR management. But I did that um, really late in my uh, in my career. I left school at 16 because I was sure that I was going to be a famous rock star. And I pursued that path for uh, for many years. Um, my mine was a misspent youth or maybe maybe not so much misspent playing guitars and uh, uh, and being in rock bands and it wasn't until my mid-20s that I decided that perhaps that wasn't going to work out for me and that I should get a proper job <laughs> we'll have to explore a little bit more about uh, your uh, your time <laughs> in rock and roll and all that so so that's what you did in school um at later on in mid your mid-20s so so tell us about your career progression then once you got uh, you studied HR management, and and so how did you get to where you are now? Can you share with us that career progression, and along the way, perhaps tell us a little bit about anything interesting that you worked on over the course of your career? Yeah, sure. So um, after I gave up my dream, um, <laughs> I joined uh, Lloyd's TSB Card Services. So Lloyd's TSB is a is a bank based uh, based. Um, uh, predominantly here uh, and credit in credit cards i was in um, debt collection and i joined there on the phones um, very quickly i was a team leader um, as a team leader i went on a training course and the guy who was delivering that program on i think it was coaching skills his name's robin fenner uh, i think that uh, last time i saw robin he was director of l d for one part of american express so he's gone on to uh, to bigger things um, but he, he delivered a training course and it was at that moment during day one that I thought, man, this is a job. Um, and I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never been on a training course before, but, um, I just loved it. Um, I became friends with, uh, with Robin, um, for, I mean, like, I, it's, a, it's a strange old situation. I carried on doing my team leader job, but I volunteered at one of the this country's richest organizations uh, to deliver their induction in the evening. So I kind of, I, I kind of did bolted on an extra element of, uh, of my job um, to, to, to become a trainer. So, so I used to work during the day. I used to do induction in the evening for the new starters. Um, I never actually joined Robin's team, but I was always doing bits and bobs. Um, 
And I did that for about a year. And then an opportunity came up as a standalone trainer uh, in a, another bank. So, so I joined there. I was there five years. I really did have free reign. So um, I began, started by delivering the induction that they had, started refining that, started then developing core skills programs. E-learning became more prominent. So I started to build uh, an e-learning facility. And over five years, I pretty much built uh, a training and development function from scratch, which was a wonderful place to, to cut my teeth and hone my skills in those areas. I joined Lima Brothers for a year. Um, I wasn't keen on uh, on what was happening at Lima Brothers. Um, I swear, even though I didn't have a great time there, it was nothing to do with me. Um, the, uh, the collapse. Um, <laughs> after a year, though, um, I... I jumped i'd left a, a, a full-time job to uh, to take a three-month contract at disney um the the role was to help roll out their uh, performance new performance management system uh, I, my contract was extended by another six months in 2006 but by the end of the year um, my boss had left and i was asked to backfill to to take on the role of uh, of learning and development manager for the uk um, there was a new head of hr there who liked the way i work so I was there for five years, and um, that's when I re—I think I really learned learning and development. And I think there are, you know, we could talk about it later. There are a couple of really key elements of my career that I think that that um, that required a step change. The first one was moving from training and development to a learning and development function in a very sophisticated matrix business. Um, I learned a hell of a lot. For which I'll, uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that that I'll be able to, to tell some stories um, in the the rest of the through the rest of your questions. Um, and then the the final part of my Disney was I was there five years and I got the tap on the shoulder and I got asked would I be interested in looking after uh, learning talent and OD for Europe, Middle East, and Africa across all of Disney's divisions. Uh, and that was an opportunity that uh, that um, that I didn't want to pass up. But I knew. Um, around about the five year mark that I was going to cash in my Disney chips at some point that I thought that I'd be able to use that that credibility that I'd gained to make a mark in the profession. I think that I found that the further I went up in uh, in Disney in learning and development, the less learning and development I was doing and the more politicking. So I decided to bail then and um, make change via via technology so that we could really use technology to drive change through our profession rather than it being perhaps seen as a supplementary addition. So you've told us a little bit about Loop, but tell us a little bit more. So did, did you start this? Did you start this with others? What was your goal? What were you thinking? Well, so I didn't, so I didn't um, start it. I, uh, so the week after I left Disney, I went to the CIPD's um, annual learning and development show. And the first stand I went to in the exhibition, I met Ben from Loop. I'd never heard of Loop, and I'd uh, uh, and I'd never met Ben. But Ben knew somebody that I used to work with at Disney uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So we started to have a conversation. Um, he offered to show me the platform um, and did. And literally within minutes, and I still remember, no word of a lie, I said to him, this is the first piece of learning technology that I've seen that I would use. Through years, 15 years of pushing e-learning, 15 years of trying to get people to use an LMS, all that time wondering, you know, what it would take to actually get people to it. And then within a few minutes, I'd seen Loop and thought, we've been getting this all wrong. You know, I mean, and it was simple. It was rapidly creating resources that were personalized to specific people. This was in minutes and showing me something that was important to me, sharing that, popping that up, you know, and then I was thinking, but if we could do this so quickly here that met that need there. And then I just became a massive advocate for a year. Um, I was just chatting with Ben and, uh, and Dan, you know, in loop, telling them all the ways that I could think of that, that, that their platform could massively ad, uh, advantage uh, learning and development functions. Um, and it was at that time, um, Ben gave me a call and he said, and his exact words were, how do you fancy joining the dark side? Um, I would never consider being a vendor before. Um, but I thought, how easy is it to sell something that you believe in so much? So that started my journey five years ago. 
uh, with Loop. And we've advanced that then. And the whole premise is if you can help people with what they're trying to do when they're trying to do it in anticipation of their needs, engagement is the least of your worries. You then move on and think, how much can we affect actual performance and results? And that's the journey that we've been on over the last five years. Well, excellent. Here, here, uh, this uh, orientation to performance. So that's a great segue into my second question, which is, can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to what I call and others HPT, human performance technology, which is also known as evidence-based practices for performance improvement or HPI, human performance improvement or performance technology. Perform it's got a bunch of different names. So uh, can you share with us your first exposure to this? But let's start with how do you refer to this? Oh, this is this is a tricky one, guy, because I, I I'm all for a term that describes specifically what something is, and when it clear, so clearly differentiates from a preceding practice. So I'm all for human performance technology. Um, uh, data and evidence-based practice, you know, all of, all of that stuff. It's distinct from what we've done before. But I always hesitate and think, <coughs> excuse me, who am I talking to? Because more often than not, the person I'm talking to isn't interested in what it's called. They're interested in what it does. So if we are talking the language of of helping people to do what they're trying to do better so that they can more predictably and reliably get the results that they're employed to do, I'd call it anything, but, but make sure that we don't get wrapped up in the, uh, in the jargon. Now I've already told the story about my first exposure to this. When I first saw loop and thought that helped, that will help with that. But if I take a step backwards, my, my last role at Disney, um, when I was director of learning and talent, uh, an OD, I had a small team, but really my stakeholders were the UK about the, the, the head of finance, the, you know, the head of marketing, all of, all of those folks who were, um, uh, directly reported into the president of the European, um, business. He also had, um, direct reports who looked after the European regions. A lot of them both sat on both sides. Now, I don't think I had a learning conversation in two years. I had conversations like, uh, Italy aren't ready for digital transformation. What are we going to do to make sure they have the awareness and the skills? I'm like, there isn't a training course for this, right? This, this is a, we can't do e-learning. If, if, even if I was asked, David, could you prepare a training course? I'm sitting there going, yeah, I prepare your training course, but I, w I will be running as far as I uh, as fast as I can outside his building straight afterwards. If I really was going to stake my reputation on that working for that, you know, I mean, that was a, a real case. We run mini accelerated apprenticeships all face to face because Disney at the time had a clunky LMS full, full of generic e-learning and our training courses were like everybody else's. I mean, they were, look, they were nice experiences and people would have got, had a couple of aha moments over the period of a day or two, but would it have prepared them for fundamentally change jobs no um merging the the sales functions so so having a um a, a very disparate sales and therefore negotiating approach towards something that was more unified and that you could leverage we couldn't run training courses for that i mean i could have people in a training course for 10 days solid and we wouldn't have done what was required mini accelerated apprenticeships largely like exclusively face-to-face -face, hugely inefficient you know, effective, yes, but it was just so cumbersome. So I think at that point, I became aware that my my role, which was learning and development before, which was much more around uh, activities, programs and content, was fundamentally different because the expectation had changed. My whole perception of my role had changed. I, I had the conversation with a lot of people and say, nothing prepared me for those two years. In fact, I'd say that the first five years delivering programs was almost a red herring that that wasn't the job at all that that's the job i was fooled into thinking this was because i because there was an apprenticeship in the classroom but the real job is and always was this job here it's about business it's about performance and more than anything else it's about results then you've got the the, the layers within that sandwich uh, which are um uh, efficiency uh, which, which I think is massively misinterpreted in learning and development to let's do what we're currently doing, but cheaper um, and um, predictable, reliable, effective. You know, it's all of that stuff, which which 
is much more sophisticated add on some politics as a as a garnish as well and you know and the job is is unrecognizable but that was my um that was what led me to think that learning and development is incomplete and to think that what we do in delivering uh, isolated and infrequent programs to a third of our organization because the other two thirds they're doing their own thing we never see them supplemented by generic e-learning that we can't get people to unless we make it mandatory. Thinking, what are we doing? Like, what what is all of this? And I left I left in frustration, exasperation. That that role at Disney. Don't be wrong. I think it'd be the easiest thing in the world to have stayed in the corner office with the title, stayed there long enough for another promotion of the like. But I couldn't do that. But I could also see that I couldn't do the job with what I was doing and expected to do at Disney with the tools I had available to me. So that's that's the so I got my 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 first aha moment with uh, with Loop. I've got the 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 thing that propelled me with um, at Disney. But then as soon as I'd seen Loop and I plugged in and I had the time and this was the the real luxury. I had the time to then look around and I, and I saw the first person I saw Nick Shackleton Jones in Loop. We called them topics. Nick was calling them resources, not courses. And all of a sudden it's like. That's what it is. You're now. This is now helping us make sense of of what we had. The whole resource is not courses, which is the proof. The the concept's been proved with Google and YouTube. Doesn't need proving anymore. It just needs us to catch up and recognise where the value lies for us in learning and development functions and the people in which we serve in service of of our organisation. So Nick Shackleton Jones was a was a, a key person there uh, that helped make sense of it. Uh, Bob Mosier and Conrad Goffredson, um, yourself, as soon as you lift the lid on this, you kind of think, wait a minute, what have I been doing? Why have I not seen this? I mean, as soon as I saw Guy, that you're saying, you know, you, you, you've been doing this stuff since the 70s. I'm thinking I, when we talked on my podcast, I was thinking, why have we not learned? Why did I complete an apprenticeship in learning and development in the, the late 1990s and early 2000s without knowing this stuff. Why, am I, why, why have I only been talking about the shift from learning to performance in the last five years when it is the most important conversation, one of the most important conversations uh, facing our profession right now? So there's kind of a, a timeline that has a, a fixed point in the middle but had plenty of momentum before. Yes. So a couple of great points you made there is that you you don't use the phrase or one variation of it of human performance technology because people, are, your clients aren't interested in what you call it. They just want results and they don't want the background. If it really works well for them, they may be interested in understanding a little bit more about that magic, which it isn't. Um, but yeah. And uh you know, you're expressing the lament of many, uh, many of the gurus that I came across in the United States about why aren't people picking up on this performance orientation? Why aren't they focused on guidance or job aids or what we now call performance support first as the default rather than a training course where we're expecting everybody to memorize everything and which is impossible. But, mm. but so thank you for all that. So that's a Great segue into my next question, which was some of your biggest influences. And what I'm looking for here are pointers for our audience to people, articles, or books. So you've mm -hmm. already mentioned Nick. So you might want <clears throat> to, or exclude him, whatever you want to do. <laughs> have a little fun with Nick here in this. Um, but uh, so who would you point people to that were, that were your early influences? And later on, we can get to some of your maybe more recent ones. Yeah, so I'd say that uh, that I'd, I'd say I was late to this first of all. So I think that that my influences were were influenced by the by the earlier folks. So so it was uh, Gottfriedson and Mosher in uh, in a Learning Solutions Mag article on the five moments of need that really um, helped me to to make sense of 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 how this stuff can apply to the roles of learning and development. It's, you know, it's Conrad and Bob's understanding of what the, the job of learning and development is, the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty, that means that the five moments of need maps onto that. There was a phrase that uh, from, I think it was from that, um, that article that said, the sweet spot of learning and development 
is to be there at the moment of need to influence the moment of apply it. And you know, you're thinking that is such a beautiful, concise description of learning and development's potential that we miss by miles. I always say that that a just in time course. So so with the best will in the world, we might send someone on a presentation skills course because months before or weeks if we're being generous, they had a presentation to do. They've done it. They've already done it. The, the moment's already gone. So they have this experience that they largely, well, I suppose through a little bit of fear and anxiety and an embarrassment of having to do all this presentation stuff, had a lovely experience. But it's ages away before. We've missed the mark. You know, the next presentation isn't for absolutely ages. We've missed the, the, the opportunity to influence them. But what they describe and, you know, Conrad and, and Bob uh, describe is starting at the moment of apply and working backwards. And, you know, to get to your credit card, you've literally just said that, um, you know, starting at the moment of apply, working backwards. And once you have addressed that, what else what else is actually required is you know is there a need for a, a training course at all so so i'd say you know off the back of that i read innovative performance support which is um bob and conrad's book which i think is uh, is essential reading and of course the references in there point to, to to their influences as well um i can't let nick shackleton jones go by without another mention because his work his book um although um not necessarily as a, a key influencer, but I think that as a consolidation of, uh, of ideas, um, how people learn, talks brilliantly about blowing apart a lot of the mythology around learning and development, uh, how we almost exacerbate the, that mythology and the rituals by growing trainers in classrooms where really we, we're missing the opportunity to, to understand what the real problems are and then... Um, uh, addressing that with experiences or resources, I'd say that that you know, he's been blogging since uh, oh God, well over ten years, and I think that that's that's a, uh, a concise record of, uh, of his thinking and beyond. But I would also throw in here um, essentialism by Greg McKeon uh, because they, I mean there's a lovely phrase in there. Uh, with, first of all, the whole premise is um, that if we break down what we need to do to un to to address a problem with the minimum number of steps, what's the least we can do in order to affect results? I think it's everything uh, that the that learning and development needs to do. Um, first of all, there is the, as, as we, you've been talking about <laughs> since the, the 1970s, that pivot you know, from looking at a learning solution to a performance problem. But then there's, again, there's a lovely phrase when it's in essentialism uh, that, that says, how do we make the minimum valuable progress? I love that because so often in learning and development, we make big bets. After, after we've hawked around our PowerPoint, trying to gain support from all these stakeholders, you know, once we've got that and we've covered our back, we've made our spend, we've bought our platform or we've, we've scheduled our program, everyone's gone through it. So often we, we sit back and think, did that make a difference? <laughs> but, but what essentialism talks about is understanding what's going on and then stripping it right back and saying, if we were going to do just one small thing, what would that be to make the biggest possible difference? The whole book, I mean, look, I, I hope Greg isn't listening here and, you know, uh, <laughs> probably a long shot if he is. But I would say that that is a pamphlet's worth of content in, filled out in a book. It's a very simple premise, and I'm sure that there are uh, much smaller edited editions that, that will get you what you need here. But I'd say that those three books, for me, are, are pretty integral to, uh, to, to what it is that we need to do uh, in learning and development. Very cool. Thank you for that. Let's uh, shift gears here slightly. Um... If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech, and what we're why we're doing this is so that we can provide an example to others. So what is your short and sweet 30-second or so elevator speech on what you currently do? Um, I won't be the, only, the first person to say during this section, uh, Guy, that I hate this question. Uh, <laughs> From, from from my earliest days, I used to say to people, proudly, I'm a trainer. Straight away, straight in there, they'd say, um, oh, what, a personal trainer? And you go, oh, no. And then you're in a hole that you can't get out of because it's already in the head that they're a personal trainer. Oh, no, no. You know, training courses, 
yeah, yeah. And, you know, and then, then it goes from there and it very quickly it's moved on. It's like, oh, no, no, what do you do? Try to change. It, and this question got a lot easier at Disney because I used to just say, oh, I work at Disney. And then the conversation just goes <laughs> on. And it's not about me, it's about them. But now I'm back where I was before. Um, do you know what, there's, there's always a couple of streams from this because we sell to L&D, don't we? So, so whatever I always say, I always talk to L&D people, which is very different to if I was talking to somebody at a, a dinner party. If I was talking to someone at a dinner party, I'd, I'd probably say, um, oh, I just help people who, to get better at their jobs with technology. You know e-learning, and they'll always go, oh, yeah. I'll go, <laughs> I do technology better than that. Like, so it's almost as if you know, you're trying to say, I fix the e-learning problem in a different way. But I try to get off that conversation as quickly as possible. But if I'm talking about two L&D people, it is about um, uh, using, using digital technology and approaches to make the real difference that we in organizations are trying to do in learning and development. You know, before we've always said it's supplementary to face-to-face, but we've really always known that people didn't really go on that many uh, face-to-face programs then all of a sudden google took over and everybody googles when they need an answer but imagine that you were guiding and supporting people to do more of the right stuff when they really needed your help as they transition into and through your organization more predictably and reliably getting the results that they need so they feel good you look good and everybody wins mm-hmm. it's kind of okay. like that that I, you know that sounds well I, I think a key point here and this is you know not everybody has mentioned this. It depends on the audience. Yeah. And if it's a neighbor, you know, I'll just give them a, a simple answer or whatever because they don't, probably don't really care. But if it's somebody in the business or an executive or a customer, that's when you really need to attune. And, and even within those audiences, within our realm, we need to speak a little bit differently to an, another L&D professional versus a customer or a stakeholder. Um But uh, I think that's a key point is that you need to have at the ready a couple of different answers depending on who's asking the question. And perhaps before answering it, you can clarify who they are and where they're coming from on this if you really want to do that. It depends on how long the elevator ride is also. It could be 90 (laughs) floors or, you know, one floor. Let's shift here to, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us What's your current or future focus for your own learning? Um, and can you share that with us? Yeah, sure. So, so, so first of all, my, my focus now is on, uh, on data and its application to what learning and development is in organizations to do. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation with, uh, with Trish Ull on my podcast very recently. Uh, quite wonderfully, we didn't actually talk about learning metrics. Le- as you know, she described um, the, the different types of data. You have summative, which learning and development's always done, which is after an event. Um, but then you've got formative, which is understanding uh, what it what actually needs working on, what might be critical points of failure, what would be our milestones if we were to address this. So it's everything before you get to solution, which learning and development aren't particularly great at um, because we've never really focused on performance than learning because what we've always tried to do is get people into and through the learning so that was almost the formative how do we get people to it and then the summative which is uh, did they like it did it work um but of course data changes that whole thing so so um my focus and my learning is how we apply principles of data science into the profession the broader profession of learning and development if we are taking the opportunity that is available to us not just doing the job of L&D then further down the line it's to what extent can we um, take advantage of predictive analytics not to necessarily predict behavior of people but to to predict when our support and guidance is actually required and in service of what And as an organization within Loop, we're always looking at and learning and experimenting on how much closer can we get to the point of work? Because in the words of of Comrade Bob, if we we could be there at the moment of need, we stand a greater chance of influencing the moment of apply. So so that's where so much of my my thinking and learning is going with that which you know talking to to, to people like uh, like trish is invaluable but 
Um, but it's people coming into our profession, like Gemma Patterson. Again, I had a, a conversation with her um, on the podcast. She's at Aviva, and she looks after learning technology there. But Nick Shackleton Jones hired her from digital marketing. And when I talked with her, and she's saying, um, well, we, what we've done in digital marketing is we, we have a dashboard. So we understand you know, what is actually going on with our target audience. And you know, you're thinking, what's the L&D equivalent of that? You know, which five people are rattling around in the LMS at any one time trying to complete their mandatory training? It's kind of we, we don't operate off of dashboards, you know, that, that provide um, real real time data on an organization, its people, their goals, their progress, their blockers. So it's all about the work. Imagine learning and development and looking at the whole picture and not just this tiny little part, which is more about justifying the expenditure in the technology than actually affecting the work. So, so a lot of my, my, uh, my research, my thinking, um, the, the incubation time for that to become writing is all in that area. I think that, uh, that if, I've, if I've learned anything over the last five years coming out of learning and development, it is if you don't know the real problems that you're trying to solve, any activity will do. But if you can just zero in on the real problems uh, or the friction that's being experienced by people within any critical point of failure, your efforts can be laser focused on actually affecting not just behavior, but results. It is, it's chalk and cheese, the approaches. They really are. That if you're talking to the unindoctrinated, the, 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 the true learning and development people, and you're talking about solving real problems in real time, they look at their, you know, they look at the learning and development landscape and think, how do I do that? If I broke all my courses down into the moments of need, that would take me years. And you know, I go, no, you've got to, you've got to get rid of those. Those are big bets. Those are, those are filled full of assumptions. Those are theoretical uh, and they're not really grounded in the gritty reality that your people are experiencing. They, they, they like, they, they're likely to have a place, maybe, but this stuff over here where we are folk zeroing in on, on real needs and, uh, and things that will make a difference, that, that there, I think, is, 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 is where. And so, there's much, so it's all about using data, the utilization of data, um, first of all, to understand the landscape, further down the line, predictability, and then turning the light on for learning and development. How can we provide that dashboard so that learning and development, Gemma Jim, Jim uses this great um, analogy in the podcast. So she worked at a, um, a fashion outlet, an online fashion outlet. And when the, the weather forecast was rain, what are they going to have on the homepage? They're going to have coats and umbrellas. You know, they're going to be ready for that. But, you know, that's their dashboard looking at the, wide, you know, the, the wider landscape. What are learning and development doing? They've got their heads down looking and thinking, I've got a new leadership development program that I've just gained a lot of credibility. What well, I've, I've just borrowed a lot of credibility for, and I'm about to sink a load of costs in it. I better show that this works. It's very much focused, topic-centric rather than uh, the, the people-centric. So you, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I love Trish and uh, what, what she's sharing with everyone and what she's bringing to the whole uh, field, if you will. Um, besides doing podcasts on these kinds of things, are you want to tell the audience a little bit, are you writing about this? Are there places that they can go to learn a little bit more about this? We'll, uh, I will include the mm. URL to your podcast site here so that people can uh, uh, look at those. But uh, is there any other place that they can look? Yeah, so, so my website is davidinlearning.com. And be able to find my my. My thinking, my rambling uh, on there. Um, I, I have written some pieces on uh, on data and my journey uh, up to this point, which I think reflects. And also, I, um, it reflects not just my learning, but how I've taken that and applied that to the challenges that I've faced in the different organizations that I have uh, been in learning and development teams and led the function. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, I hope people uh, follow up and take a good look at that. One of the challenges that we have in our field is our language. It's mm -hmm. a mess in my view and in view of many others here. But So my next question is, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? But let me further set this up. It may not be a favorite 
term or phrase. It may be an annoying term or phrase, and perhaps you feel that people are misusing it, it's being misconstrued, there's issues with it, and you want to put your own spin on it. Now, I've begun mm -hmm. to ask people if you've got more than one of those, go ahead and give them all to us, though, because I think it's helpful for our audience to understand some of the issues that we have with the labels that we use. What have you got? So um, to address the performance part head on, I'd say that performance consulting, you can't go wrong and performance support, you can't go wrong. I think that uh, prevalent terms. But if I was going to say that if I was going to define or point us in a direction, uh, learning and development, I'd say data and evidence based practice. I think that working on the right stuff gets us halfway there. So data and evidence based practice isn't just the, the umbrella term. I think it, it points to what we need to be seeking and in areas that we need to be developing and just to be clear by data it is uh, first of all understanding that there is and have an overview of a critical point of failure something that is important to the organization so that would that could be customer satisfaction that could be uh, sales that could be uh, service level agreements. It's got, what is core to the organisation. To what extent are you successful in any of those areas? So, the, so, and it, and and it doesn't need to just relate to the core business. Of course, in like bigger businesses, there are elements that don't relate to to the front end. So, uh, there might be uh, things around uh, employee retention. Uh, there could be uh, people being ready for work. You know, like once they join the organization so whatever is absolutely critical to the organization that is either costing the business or costing the money data i think is our friend but if it's not a pro if it's not a real problem we we don't really stand a chance of gaining the engagement that we need from the people that we're seeking to influence let alone make a difference so data i think is critical but the evidence is to what extent and how is that affecting real people because after all change begins and ends with people. So if the data says that there's a problem and we understand that to a degree, to what extent is that actually influencing uh, or what is it that people are actually doing that they need to change or adapt or we need to further equip in order to affect that data? And then that data is then simply the milestone. To what extent are we satisfied that things are moving in the right direction because we are doing more of the right stuff? So that's why I think data and evidence-based practice as a term helps us to understand our, the importance of what we do and also where we as a profession need to develop. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, back to the formative and summative evaluation and the data mm. that, and what it informs. But uh, thank you for that. Uh, my next question, uh, which of course now the audience knows that I've shared with you, but that's fine that they know that because I hope, hope that they understand. <laughs> We've done some preparation for this. But the, my next question is about some of the uh, uh, can you share with us some stories of people who have influenced you, uh, whether it's your early practice or your later practice in this evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or you've just said data and evidence-based practice. Um, and what I'm looking to do is kind of humanize some of the people that mm. maybe you've heard, we've heard, or maybe it's somebody that no one's heard of and you want to do a shout out of them. But so I'm looking for any serious stories or funny stories or anything you can tell us about them so that we we can understand them a little bit and uh, you can uh, share with us uh, some of those people that uh, again were influential to you so I've, I've mentioned the the the, the thought leaders uh, as it were but I think that uh, the um, Learning and development happens inside organizations, not out from the outside with thought leaders. So I'd like to, to have a big shout out to Tracy Waters. She is director of people and engagement at Sky based uh, over here in the UK. Uh, Tracy and her team began their, ad, their journey into agile in the summer of 2016. Um, again, I've had Tracy on the podcast, but I've known Tracy for years. My, my wife used to work for Tracy uh, uh, many, many years ago, um, and we, we had equivalent roles. We had she at Sky and uh, at me, at, uh, me at Disney. Um, but what she's done there, I think, is truly remarkable. Um, I asked her why she, um, uh, she decided to pivot into Agile, and her response on the podcast was, because doing the same things and expecting different results 
is the very definition of insanity. Yes. Um, and that was the basis of our conversation, that she'd been there a number of years. She'd led the function. You're kind of thinking, this is as far as I can take it with current or perhaps outdated thinking. So what is it that we can do in order to, to not just move the learning and development function forward, but almost reframe it as and, and the value proposition. So um, wonderfully, she pretty much did the pivot to her stakeholders by creating a video that says, this is why the, the current L&D practice doesn't work. People go on courses, they don't remember what's going on. It, it's not humanly possible. People res actively resist e-learning. We're not getting engaged with this, da, 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 da. The reason is people go to Google. What are they getting at Google? They get predictable and reliable um, searches, but none of it relates to Sky. So... Once you've, blown, once you've blown up the whole island, you've got to build something else quick. So she created a vision. What if we did provide people with what they needed, when they needed? It was about the performance and the results that they had. It was about our culture. So she just painted this picture. And now she spent the last three and a half years, first of working on the biggest problems that faced their organization. They did that agile. So they bring a squad together that then they would understand the, what the actual problem was. Again, starting with the biggest one. It's got a backlog that lists all the problems, not a training needs analysis. This isn't the allocation of resources that, uh, that we, can, we can apply to this number this year, this number next, and so on. This is, these are the priorities in order, and we are going to address these in weekly or two weekly sprints. And then once we've got the affected the the change that we wish to and we've got that plate spinning we will move forward um and she she's fundamentally changed that team i i would say that i'm not doing it justice but i don't need to because she is her and her team have been blogging this the whole time they've got on the medium platform they've got um uh, a series um called um agile in learning and they have catalogued and recorded everything that that they've gone through first of all in becoming students of Agile. And knowing Tracy uh, for all these years, we did meet with her in August 26. She was talking about the rituals, the tools, um, experimenting with that, um, making friends with the IT team who were already working like this so that they had um, mentors um, and guides within the function and then exploring what that could actually mean. And now they're in a position where, again, I'm, I, you know, I'd say to, to we mean some of the change that's gone on there, but um, say, uh, I had a conversation with Tracy and asked her, how do you then? So you've got a powerful stakeholder who says, I want a training course about X. And I said, how, how do you convince them? And she said, it's with data. So, so you know, sit down and go, brilliant. Okay, right. Let's get the data to understand what the real problem is. Have a look and go, oh, it's not a real problem, is it? <laughs> you go, I mean, how can you argue? There's, there's not a problem. It's, a, you know, you, there might be some, uh, some allocation of resources to go and fulfill a need, but let's not, let's not pretend this is a problem. These are problems, and what they're doing is they're integrating it into the tools that people use for work. They run campaign approaches, so recognizing that one and done isn't, isn't particularly helpful for people. But if you can get to people when they need your help, Provide them with a campaign that anticipates their needs because not only have you got the data, but you've got the evidence. So your work, you've worked with the, the, the client group that you're seeking to influence and in anticipation of their needs, they're alerted to the stuff that will help them in that context. And we're not just talking about process. We, we are talking about helping them with the skills. So, so at a particular time of joining an organization, or join, like joining um, at Sky at a particular level, they're guided and supported to do more of the right stuff. Because what one thing that uh, that they've learned, as you know, as, as I've learned, I'm sure you have as uh, as well, guy, is that um, when people are new to an organisation or new to a role, it's very rarely the technical aspects that people have got a problem with. It's you know they've they're already interviewed a lot. Most of the time, we could say about 95% of the time, they've got the at least the raw the, the skills. But what they don't know how to do is to do enough of the right stuff that's expected and rewarded in the context of that organization in order to influence and get people on side. So it's, it's, the, it's how to communicate and how to influence, which is always different across all organizations. Then you've got the different layers of processes and systems, uh, norms and practices, all of that stuff. But that's all, that's all glued together. That's nothing that you'll ever get by reading the One Minute Manager. You'll never find a Google search on any of that stuff. There's not e-learning, there's not even a, a, a training course that you'll go on, even if it is 
months or years after you became a manager that covers the gritty reality of how to do enough of the right stuff in order to, first of all, to gain the credibility that you could use as a manager and then go on. So Tracy and her team have been doing this three and a half years now. Um, working through that backlog of, uh, uh, of the priorities, which now has changed. The whole conversation in Sky has changed from can you deliver this training to I've got a problem that I hope you can help me with. Fundamentally dif- uh, like different. Um, they've been using Loop uh, all of that time. And um, there is a, um, uh, also a case study that's been written by Fosway interviewing Tracy and members of her team talking about how they got to this position and how they started with managers because it was a critical area for which they needed to address and then they've broadened and it's and it's gone from there so I'd say that if I was gonna, if this was going to lead to anything rather than it's like inspiring people with my story I hope this inspires people to follow those rabbit warrants have a look at that that blog the agile in learning on medium and that case study that Fosway have written excellent thank you is there anybody else? That, you've brought up something here, and I've I made a note here so I can come back to this, but I don't want to interrupt the flow here. Is there anybody I, else that you'd like Yeah, to? so I'd say also Adam Harwood. Adam Harwood's introduced this into three organizations now. So, uh, so first of all, at ASOS, um, where he introduced a resources-first uh, approach, which first of all, got in, uh, incredible engagement. And then, I mean, when, when they started to do induction there, it was all about solving a, a very pressing problem. But it was so successful that they went down to particular teams. Like this, is, I mean, it's the approach is so easily tweaked and tailored. So it's, re, it's a revolute where it was only there for, for eight months, uh, I believe. Um, but they, during that time, famously, he didn't run a single training course, but he had embedded a resources first approach first to compliance and then moved uh, moved on but then he got a tap on the shoulder and, and then got approached to do this at D&D uh, which of course during coronavirus times is going through problems like uh, like anywhere else is but before then he's got a resources first approach flying um, you know within, within a few months again changed from a, uh, a predominantly face-to-face uh, culture to one where it is digitally led and addressing the key concerns of both people and the organization. So, so Adam Harwood, he does blog, um, uh, but I've had him on the podcast as well. And when he talks, he talks about the real realities of, uh, of getting this stuff to work, how using resources first as an approach is faster, cheaper, less risky, and more about affecting the work than what we were doing previously in learning and development. So not only is he a convert, he's experienced of three organizations in quick succession introducing this and leaving learning and development in a far better position than, uh, than, than when he joined. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I would, yeah, I'd say uh, Jeremy McClellan, um, I've had on the podcast doing great, doing great stuff. He, um, so in the, the conversation I had with him, he was head of L&D at a recruitment company and with a resources first approach, reduced the uh, billing time of recruitment consultants from 12 months to three months. Now, don't tell me this stuff doesn't work. Do you know what I mean? So, so, and again, so because he's focused on the real problems to be solved in the organization rather than the learning provision. Um, but no, I could, I could go on. These are, these are people making waves. I've already mentioned Gemma Patterson, uh, Mike Collins at, uh, uh, at River Island. Um, I've got a podcast episode with Nabel Crowhurst coming up. She's head of uh, L and D at Roche. Now she uh, completed the pivot, um, of both, I think it was L and D at River Island, and now they're going through that at Roche. I mean, that's a wonderful case study. Uh, not just in L and D, um, she's head of HR, so she's done the whole of HR, but the whole organisation is pivoting to agile because, well, she knows that this works. So, um, yeah, I'd say that there's one thing: your Nick Shackleton Jones, your, uh, your your Bob and Conrad, your your Trishul, your Nigel Harrisons, your good self. Uh, you know, Guy, as well as I do, I mentioned it earlier, learning and development happens in organizations. If you haven't worked in L&D in an organization for any period of time, you are at a significant disadvantage on both understanding and influencing the profession. So I'd say that, that the folks that I've mentioned with the background of successfully 
leading learning and development functions. They know they know this stuff is real. And, um, you know, you've only got to read, you know, Nick, Shuck, Nick, Nick knows how L&D works. Nigel Payne knows how L&D works. You know, all the folks that I've spoken about so far, they've uh, they've they've. They've got the scar, the battle scars. <laughs> they know. They they know. You'll never hear any of those folks saying, um, you know, you 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 buy an LMS, you customize it, you get engaging content, you get your comm strategy right, you build it, and they will come. Nobody will say that stuff. It's all about you know. You've had to be there when you've launched something, whether it's successful or not. It's when you can't run away. That's when you get your battle scars. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that and mentioning all those people, and I hope our audience uh, follows up with them. Um, so this resources first, um, but that's the, my real question is Google search. You've mentioned this several times now. now. A lot of people think that, oh, well, we've got Google here. We don't need training. We don't need, res-. you know, that's the resource. But there's there's issues with that, I think, and I you, you said it, but I wanted to come back and, and circle back to this and revisit this, but... Why or why not would a when or when not would a Google search be sufficient to a performer's need? What's your take on that? Uh, I'd say in knowledge work, I think that we we rely enormously on Google because we need ideas and expertise from outside in order to build onto our work. I think that what was there a study done? Um, uh, a uh, longitudinal, longitudinal study in 2005 or 2006 that said that um, what was it only 26% of what a knowledge worker knows is actually in their head. That was 2006. Um, excuse me if I've if, if I've got you know any of the dates or, or percentages wrong. But you consider that was before we had the iPhone and before we had years. I mean we've had decades now of information at our fingertips, so the reliance is there. So I'd say that Google plays an incredible, incredible part. If you throw in freelancers as well, then YouTube is everybody's friend. But I'd say that it that Google can go a long way to replacing the old role of L and D, which is the content provider. But the new role of L and D, which I, I believe that it's no, it's no longer a uh, an opt in on affecting performance. You can only get the right stuff done in an organization by knowing how to get the right stuff done in that organization. That is all. So, so, it's all, so we hear this all the time, context over content. I always say, Google's got your content covered. Don't you worry about that. And if people say, yeah, but it's not such good quality and it, it might not be engaging again, seriously, in your, if that, that's what you're positioning yourself as, what was it, Miles Runham, uh, who I've had on the podcast as well, he was general manager of ask.com in Europe. So, you know, ask.com was a, a search engine. His words on the podcast were, don't compete with Google. I've tried. <laughs> 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 yeah, you go. So, so a lot of the time, if we're looking at co- as a content play, Google's won. Don't worry about that. They've got that covered. But inside your organization, the real problems, the blockers that are stopping your people as they transition into your organization about understanding how to get the right stuff done and influence. And then as you increase in sophistication, as your managers become leaders and their exposure increases, both uh, their exposure to the, the top brass and clients, but also exposure as in no one's got their back, who's helping them? Because I can tell you something for nothing. Google hasn't got their back. So L&D have got a critical role in ensuring that the investment in any performer as they come in but as you go up and the risk increases um and then the expense increases l d can play a critical role by op- helping to unpack and offer a level of transparency that can show the way for uh, for these inexperienced people now people sometimes uh, will, will shoot holes in what i'm saying here and go yeah but but what if somebody isn't new to a role in your organization you're thinking i'm i'm reframing l d here to be there at the moment of need to influence the moment of apply, Conrad and Bob's words again. Mm-hmm. If they're not new to it, are they? Are you? Are they needed? Are like, where, where does it, where's L and D need? So it's always aim for the need. So where are you needed most? If you're looking to influence established um, man, middle managers who are already being rewarded handsomely for the way that things are already being done, I'm afraid that 
that that door is bolted. That's you know you're you're going to have to use a lever to get in. But you have huge opportunities across your organization. So look, that's the, that's the long way around it. Google is integral now, as is YouTube, in giving us access to information and some know-how. But all that rich stuff that means whether people are successful or not successful in an organization, in a role or in a task, that's all up for grabs. That's that's our new role in L&D. And I say that stuff is measurable. That is that's the big stuff that needs working on. Thank you. Yes, I, I am. I so agree. And I just wanted a chance <laughs> to have you make me feel better about it. All. <clears throat> because uh, as you as you and I have discussed before, uh, you know, I got into the business in 1979, and I was oriented to that in the first place. And throughout my career, to this very day, so few people are focused on the terminal performance requirements, the specific performance requirements of an organization. And, you know, their processes may look kind of alike, their practices might kind of look alike, the tools that they have are all the same, but, you know, Google's not going to cover too much of that. But there is a use for it, and it's not something we shouldn't throw away or ignore. We should leverage it, and I think that that's part of our job. But we've got to have our focus on performance, which, which I'm so happy to hear because maybe I shouldn't be so skeptical about uh, <clears throat> the pivot and whether or not uh, we as a profession will make that pivot to performance. But um, well, what if I could just add there, Guy, I, I think that, uh, that either we pivot or it'll be taken out of our hands. Uh, again, you and I have discussed before that, that with the technology that we have at our fingertips, I think it's now inevitable. But whether L&D are ready or, or are willing to prepare themselves for that pivot or not is going to be the determinant of whether we make the pivot or another function, a disruptor, will come and take that out of our hands because of how inefficiently we've been solving the wrong problems for too yeah. long. Yeah, let's, we can't uh, diminish the challenge that our peers face. Mm. You know, once they become aware of the fact that there is uh, another way to look at this, then it's the how do I get there? Where, yes. where are we starting from and what can we leapfrog, or do we have to go through all the same growing pains that uh, the rest of the world may have gone through as they've uh, uh, blazed that trail? Well, if you, uh, you know, if I were going to add one more tip here, is that if we look at the range of solutions available to us and we start there, we will never see it. People always say, I can't keep up with the market. There's always a new platform, or there is new this and new that. Stop looking at the solutions and start understanding the problem. That's why I say that the, if we base this on data and evidence-based practice, then we'll see the problems for what they really are and realize that it is easier, faster, cheaper, and more effective to solve these specific performance problems than it ever was to understand the, the solutions market and try to find the silver bullet. That never existed. In the same way as Aladdin is a made-up story, you know, he went to a cave and he found this lamp. That whole the, the L&D practice, which is built upon finding silver bullets amongst a salute like a suite of solutions, is also fantasy. There's no shortcut. Yes, so true. David, thank you so much for agreeing uh, to participate with me in this video interview. Uh, it's kind of a wrap up. Our, I'm assuming that our audience is. Uh, going to include a fair amount of people that are new to the business of L&D or performance and development or performance improvement or whatever they are calling themselves here in the future. Hopefully that shifts. But do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for that audience, whether they're younger people, middle-aged or older, about what should they be paying attention to? Now, you've said this, and I guess so this is really a kind of a summary uh, mm. Although you may surprise me and give me some new, <laughs> um, but uh, so what's your guidance for the new person? You know, how do they? You know, they come in and this is complex, and we're all over the place with our language and all the various models and methods, and you know, we've got it's just kind of a mess. So help that new person. What should they do initially and focus on? Well, I'd say if they've got to this stage in this conversation, um, then 
what, what we've been talking about and um, your previous guests, there, this is the path. This, this is the, the future of L&D. Now, the reality which they are experiencing may be contrary to this. They may have an L&D manager who values and has got where they are with the old skill set. But I'd say that your current experience should not diminish your flame. Your flame should, you know, you should follow this path, understand how to, how you can use data, how data can be your friend. Evidence-based practice is simply having conversations with the people that you're seeking to affect and work with them, not deliver at them, experiment. Stop, stop. If you can influence, you've got, you've got to earn your stripes in learning and development. You'll do that by influencing. First of all, your, then when you're that level, you'll be influencing your organization. That won't stop. Everybody's got a fixed view that learning and development looks like classrooms or e-learning content. We're, Bob Mosier says, you know, whenever I speak to him, he says, keep fighting the good fight. And now I would say, you know, you know, to everybody else here that know what you stand for. Performance, experimentation, data is your friend. And incrementally, you can you will end up influencing the people that matter. But more than anything, don't. Don't bow to the old way, the, 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 the status quo and the way that learning and development is perhaps expected to be delivered. It's much more than that. And they can be part of that, the building of it. Yes, so true. David, again, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with us here today. Um, uh, best wishes to you and stay safe, my friend. Thank you, Andrew Guy.